Ocio, hello, yate, as I say in Dene Bazad, She Bilagana Nishle, Dokia Ani Bashashin, Bilagana Dashache, Do Sinajani Dashanale, Akot Egot San Nishle, Farina King Yinishye. Um, hi, my name is Farina King. I just introduced myself by my clans that I am of white English American settler descent on my mother's side and born for the Towering House Clan and Blackstreet Woods people of the Dene Navajo Nation. I'm a, an assistant professor here at Northeastern State University in Oklahoma and an affiliate of Cherokee and Indigenous Studies program. And it is my honor and privilege to welcome you all to the NSU American Indian Symposium, as if this is your first session joining with us. Um, we hope it will certainly not be your last and please um, check out our agenda. It's all 100% virtual. And it's great to see Amelia Gadsden here. We met in Dallas and the Fort Worth area. And I'm excited to hear her research and to feature this session with her titled Framing a Sacred Fight, Framing Analysis and Collective Identity of the Hashtag No Dapple Movement. And Amelia Gadsden is joining us from the University of North Texas. Um, as I said as well, be sure to check out um, the different sessions on our website, the official agenda website of the symposium. That's how you get to them. And then um, this session, thank you for um, consenting to being recorded. The sessions are being recorded to be available later on. If some folks miss it today or you want to come back to it, these are great resources. Amelia Gadsden is a doctoral student in sociology at the University of North Texas, where she is in her last semester of courses. That is exciting, wrapping up um, her doctoral studies there. And she is pursuing research that focuses on American Indian and indigenous experiences. Amelia, I'm just gonna call you that instead of uh, Miss Gadsden. Um, Amelia's work often discusses themes of tribal sovereignty, cultural sustainability, and equity for native peoples. In addition to academic work, and I know this by seeing it personally, Amelia has been involved in local American Indian community of Dallas and Fort Worth as an advocate and organizer for several years and currently serves an, as an ambassador for the American Indian Heritage Day in Texas and the Indigenous Institute of the Americas. And she is a member of the UNT Native American Student Association. Most recently, Amelia has had the opportunity to promote American Indian interests and organize for intersectional social justice as a coalition member for In Defense of Black Lives, uh, the Dallas chapter of the movement for Black, for black Lives. So thank you, Ahyehe Wado. Thank you, Amelia, for joining us. And I'll turn the time to you to present today. Thank you. Thank you, Farina. What a great surprise to have you be the one to introduce me. Um, I'm so excited to be here today and just completely honored um, for this opportunity as this is my first symposium with you all. So this is super Ooh. exciting. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Um, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Could someone take a look at that for me? Okay, we'll get right on it. Sure, thank you. Are they enabling that? Okay. Sorry about that. It's always remembering every little step of, of the permissions. Got it. Okay. Try it again. See if, is it going? Yes. One moment. All right, can you all see that? Yes, we see it. Thank awesome. you. Okay, so I want to go ahead and start um, firstly with an acknowledgement um, and appreciation just for being here. Um, so I'm coming to you all from Denton, Texas, which is on the uh, historic tribal homelands of primarily the Wichita and affiliated tribes, as well as the Caddo people. Um, and I also want to acknowledge the DFW Native community. Um, it's an intertribal community. It's very vast. And um, without question, I would not be able to um, be involved in doing any research like this without the welcoming and uh, participation that I've been able to do within that community. 
So um, I have to get that out of the way because I'm just so grateful. Um, and then due to the context of this presentation, um, I wanna also, um, and, and I'm sorry, I get a little emotional, but um, honor the legacy of LaDonna Allard. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So of course we know that she passed this week and um, the, the topic of this research is very close to her legacy. So we wanna go ahead and um, give a moment to just um, give thanks to all of the work that she has done. So um, moving along, uh, this, this research, uh, it's a little bit dated for me slightly. So I, I started this research in 2018 this is my master's thesis work. So, um, you know, of course, since I've completed it along the, the progress of my coursework, you know, I've learned a lot and developed a lot even since this. However, um, this presentation and this research is very near and dear to me. Um, so I, I realize that there's likely a lot of people on this uh, call as well as just generally involved in the symposium who had some sort of involvement in this movement. Um, and I think that a lot of the things that we will talk about today may be familiar to you, it may be repetitive to you, um, but I do wanna go ahead and cover certain things that uh, you know might be relevant to those who don't know. So, uh, the, the movement, the Standing Rock movement for um, no DAPL or uh, against the Dakota Access Pipeline was primarily uh, in its heyday in 2016 through 2017. So this is that period of time uh, about a year before um, up and through the election of uh, Donald Trump. So this was the last year of the Obama administration, although the fight for Standing Rock and the fight for um, or against the Dakota Access Pipeline had been going on long before that. Um, but let me just give you a little bit of background um, about why it got to this point and um, why the tribes engaged in this movement. So as you can see here, this is a map. Um, I find this map very helpful because it helps to really illustrate what we're looking at here. Um, the basis for this fight typically revolved around the fact that the Dakota Access Pipeline was set originally to run through lands here, as you can see on the map, that went right above Bismarck. And then the pipeline was relocated to instead run straight through treaty lands um, right up against the Standing Rock Reservation. So the general argument um, when folks found out that the pipeline was being moved was that, well, if it were going to uh, run near Bismarck, then any water safety issues that happen with pipeline leakages would have affected a majority white community. And then moving it to an area like, uh, you know, treaty territories that we're looking at, um, if there were any water safety issues that happen, we're looking at the water of all of these tribes being affected significantly. And so we kind of see some underlying issues there with racism, of course. Um, and so on the map as well, you see that uh, where the treaty territories lie. And so the, the first significant treaty in this story is the 1851 Treaty of Fort Laramie. So this is where the Great Sioux Nation was established, and that is made up of the various bands of the Nakota, Dakota, and Lakota peoples of the Great Plains. And what this did was it established that um, there were eight Indian nations um, that covered most of present day North and South Dakota, as well as parts of Wyoming, uh, Nebraska, and Montana. So this recognized those tribes' rights to uh, access to those lands for hunting, fishing, and crossing. So the next significant treaty is the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868. And this is the one that is somewhat the most contentious in this story. So the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868, um, it established the Great Sioux Reservation. This one was called one of the most controversial treaty violations in history because it was broken in 1874 during the Black Hills Gold Rush. Um, and unfortunately, the Black Hills, uh, which many of you I'm sure know as a sacred space, uh, was lost to mining. So um, 
1868 treaty agreed that in exchange for railroads being built through this territory, um, no white person or military would have access to occupy those lands. And so this essentially said that these lands are inevitably until the end of time uh, in, you know, they belong to the great Sioux nation and the tribes contained within. Well, we move on to 1877, another land grab. And this is kind of the trend we're seeing. And unfortunately, this is something that happen has happened to a lot of tribes along the, uh, the course of time. But in 1877, the tribes are moved to even smaller portions of land. And in 1887, we see the General Allotment Act or the Dawes Act uh, that made a lot of this land reservation land held in trust. So in 1889, um, the Great Sioux Reservation was again broken up into smaller portions of land. Um, and then finally, um, another blow in 1956, which I think this one probably holds a lot of historical trauma, is that the US Army Corps of Engineers took 56,000 acres of land from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe without consent to construct the Oahe Dam. So when we're talking about DAPL, we're talking about a pipeline that's moving um, over 500,000 barrels of oil a day. And like I mentioned before, it would run under the Missouri River, which would threaten um, water supply downstream. So that is just a little bit of background about the movement and where we came from when we're talking about this. So um, the research questions that I was looking at, um, I, I looked at them because of my personal involvement in this movement. And I think it's again, funny that Farina was one of the ones who introduced me because um, she and I both participated in demonstrations and uh, protests in the DFW area during this time in 2016 and 2017. Um, where you know we were gathering out in front of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers building in downtown Dallas, or we were gathering out in front of the um, Energy Transfer Partners headquarters in Dallas, which was a kind of an even bigger deal as that was the company that was funding the Dakota Access Pipeline. So the the inspiration for this research came from the ways in which people who were not physically at protest camps during the no DAPL movement participated in the movement. Because if you were around or you were paying attention during that time, um, you know, a lot of people were doing things like sharing Facebook posts, sharing things on Twitter, um, commenting, uh, having conversations, or like I mentioned, going to demonstrations or actions in their own local area, especially in urban areas even. So I wanted to study this because I wanted to find out why did people participate in this when they may not have had a direct stake in um, you know, the chief argument behind water being threatened in that area of North Dakota. So the research questions I looked at were, what frames did the No DAPL movement use to recruit members through Facebook? Was the concept of a pan-Indian collective identity present? And was this a frame in itself? And when I'm talking about collective identity, um, I provided a definition there so that everyone can become familiar. Um, and then finally, what does this signify for the future of indigenous environmental movements and indigenous cultural preservation? So framing theory permeates a lot of different fields of study, but in sociology, when we're talking about social movements, we're really talking about how um, framing can convey a message or get people involved. So I, I included here just a little diagram um, of how people can become involved in the framing process. Um, so like I have here, frames allow people to locate, perceive, identify, and label events. So frames, um, they organize thinking, they make meaning out of situations, they encourage certain interpretations and discourage others. So if we think of framing, we can think of the ways in which a movement gets their message out, what they want people to do, and how they convey what they're trying to get done. And this is the main theory that um, I'm using here in this presentation. So the next framework that I used, um, and I'll spend a little time on this one because this is a bit contentious for me. Um, I'm sure most of you would probably agree that 
the terminology that is around um, to discuss tribal issues or indigenous issues is you know, rarely correct. It's, it's an English interpretation for words, you know, that, that previously or concepts that previously may have existed in native languages. Um, but when I was going through this research and trying to figure out why did native nations support one another? Why did indigenous peoples feel called to become involved in whatever level within this movement? And the, the main terms that come across in the literature is pan-Indianism. And um, of course, this is a non-native term that roughly originated uh, when the Native American churches were being established in Oklahoma. We see evidence of it um, in Tecumseh's journey across the North when he was trying to establish an Indian Confederacy um, amongst multiple tribes. And then we also see uh, Chido Harjo who resisted the Dawes allotment. Um, so there's historical evidence of multiple tribes coming together in terms of organizing resistance. And this, organi this organized resistance has been going on uh, arguably since European contact. Um, some suggest that uh, Indianness or the idea of being indigenous um, is partially ascribed from external sources. Um, maybe the dominant society. So unfortunately, people can be um, phenotypically uh, ascribed racial or ethnic status when, you know, appearance rarely indicates someone race, someone's racial heritage or uh, ethnic heritage. Um, but also, this can be interpreted through interpersonal relationships within Indian communities or um, uh, uh, ideas of belonging. So the super tribal and pan Indian concept, while it's not really my favorite concept to use and I really would advocate for an update of these terms. Um, it is not meant to be contentious in this research. It's not meant to erase any of the unique uh, ways of being, knowing or traditional cultural practices of any one tribe, but instead discuss the ways in which multiple tribes can come together or multiple tribal individuals can come together uh, to organize in, in arenas like this, like a social movement, for example. And then finally, the other framework I utilize were relational values. Um, and I'm sure many people uh, participating in this symposium are familiar with this concept. This is just discussing essentially that the ways in which most indigenous peoples um, and tribal nations view relational values is in stark contrast to the Western and Eurocentric ways that um, people relate to one another in the contemporary society. So um, Eurocentric society is typically driven by capitalistic worldviews, um, very individually centered, um, hierarchical um, and power structure related, whereas indigenous relational values really value uh, reciprocity, um, kinship, they value relationships to elements, land, water, air, and other organisms of four-legged beings as equal and non-hierarchical to humans. So when we consider the reasons why um, a tribal nation would get involved in a movement like this, we have to think about the ways that set in indigenous environmental resistance apart from other uh, environmental movements. So data and methods for my project, I'll go through this quickly. Um, I utilize Facebook posts, like I mentioned. The Sacred Stone Camp was the first protest camp established to resist the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, and so I utilized their Facebook page and I had to do a little bit of narrowing down just to bring uh, results within the scope of this project. So I narrowed down posts uh, by keyword, perform textual analysis, and um, of course excluded posts that did not indicate that there was any framing. So posts that were just kind of general updates or maybe videos um, or posts that were not original content created by the Sacred Stone Camp Facebook page. I did not analyze those. And then um, if you'll recall my second research question, I did identify one frame uh, prior to analysis just because I needed to be able to report whether pan-Indianism or super tribal organizing and collective identity was a frame at all. 
This is just an overview of the data analysis process. Um, this is what Facebook posts looked like when I pulled them off the website. Of course, I, I transferred that into plain text and then analyzed in Atlas TI, um, coded them with themes. And of course, when we're talking about framing and qualitative uh, data analysis, there's a lot of things that are up to personal perception. So, um, I, I coded and recoded these several times to kind of control for that in some ways um, and made sure that each frame that was identified was mutually exclusive. So here's a little bit of an overview of the top 10 frames. Um, and depending on time, I will try to get through all of these, but um, I'll go through at least the top six. Um, and this is just a breakdown of the framing tasks that most of these adhered to. And the framing tasks referred to um, was the frame motivating people to act? Was it diagnosing a problem? Was it um, saying this is what we need to do to fix it? Or was it showing the movement's identity? And as you can see here, the majority of these frames when they were used were um, trying to support the movement's identity. So we see that the movement's identity was very important in uh, relaying their messages through Facebook. And then here are some descriptive statistics that I found. Um, I have a column here of the original number of posts from this particular month that I analyzed, and then it is adjusted to the number of posts that actually contained identifiable frames. And one thing I found really interesting here, um, for those of you who, are, who were involved or who witnessed um, the events in November of 2016, at the end of November, um, this is when there was widely covered, widely covered um, news reports about people getting unfortunately tear gassed and shot with rubber bullets on the backwater bridge one night during the movement and um, it produced a lot of graphic imagery. Some water protectors were severely injured. Um, and as you can see, ironically, um, within that month, the majority of the posts that were made on Facebook contained framing language. So um, just background knowledge on the movement made that significant to me. So research questions. Um, the most salient frame was calls to action or what the movement needs frame. So this frame, um, uh, it, it just appeared the most. And one, one of the biggest calls to action that I saw um, across this research was divestiture from banks. So a main thing that the movement was really, really pushing people to do was pull your money out of these banks that are funding the Dakota Access Pipeline. Most posts contain more than one frame. That was almost always the case. Um, and then the second research question was, um, you know, I did find that there was pan-Indian and super tribal collective identity, um, but it was not super salient. It was sixth most salient. So it was there, um, but, and I'll get into this later, but I wonder um, if some frames had been combined, could it have been more salient in the analysis? So like I said, I'll go through each one of these. I'll try to be a bit brief so that we can have some time for questions at the end. Um, but firstly, calls to action and what the movement needs. Uh, here's an example. This is kind of generally how these slides will look. Um, so I've highlighted the framing language so your eyes can kind of easily go to that. And you're seeing here that the movement is saying, call people, email them, tweet them. Um, get the word out. They're saying that these are proposed solutions to ending the pipeline's construction. And this is something that we saw a lot, probably uh, uh, most throughout the movement was what can people do to support? So secondly, the second frame that I found was one that frame the government or the law enforcement, and we can kind of consider that the state in general um, as negative. And this just draws on that constant fight between the movement and all of the law enforcement agencies that were being violent um, towards water protectors. Um, and this one definitely assigns blame. And this is critical because like I said, this was in the final 
months of the Obama administration. So there was a lot of pressure coming down, um, not only on local law enforcement, who were literally acting violently towards water protectors, but from the federal government, who a lot of people involved felt were not taking the immediate and swift action that was needed. So as you can see here, they're calling out Obama, they're calling out law enforcement, um, and they're calling out their violence. And so this was a way that the movement assigned blame to the other party. And unfortunately, if, if you go on Facebook or on other websites, we see the state, um, you know, Morton County Sheriff, as well as um, other local law enforcement counter framing. So basically saying the opposite of what the movement was saying. So the third most salient frame was solidarity. And that is such a buzzword almost in any social movement and especially environmental social movements. But this frame specifically drew on um, how native nations, specifically the ones involved in the legal fights uh, based on this pipeline, drew on support from not only other native nations, but from anyone. So in this post, we can see they're asking for people to join them from across the world and stand with us. And if you were involved in this movement, you saw that definitely happen. There were definitely um, letters and videos and posts of support from um, people from other countries and just people from all over the world. So that's for sure um, a reason why people were able to be involved because they could show support essentially from anywhere. Um, and this is also a motivational frame. So it provides rationale about the calls to action that we saw in the first frame. Water is life. Um, I know that anyone who read about the DAPL movement saw that water is life, water is life. Uh, we saw that tagline constantly. Um, and, and one thing that the movement continually conveyed through Facebook posts were that, you know, this is not only an issue about our water, this is about everyone's water. So um, that's how that, that term water protector versus protester came into play. Um, so this frame was uh, consistently relevant and consistently identified in Facebook posts because this was like I mentioned at the very beginning, the, one of the biggest reasons why this pipeline was being um, fought against. Relationality. So this draws on that uh, relational values framework that I mentioned previously. And I have two slides for this because I wanna just demonstrate two different um, levels. So we have a human to human relationality and then we have a uh, human to non-human. So this first post shows human to human, um, you know, just in that language of relatives, calling everyone relatives. And I know that we can, can relate to that if you're involved in any indigenous or native community. Um, you hear the word relatives or relations thrown around a lot. And um, for me, that was why, you know, when I saw this language used, I thought that that definitely constituted a frame of its own. And so secondly, when you're talking about humans to the natural environment, this reiterates the point I made earlier about just being in symbiosis with the natural world and not separating the natural world from humans. And I, I, I definitely think that this is something that um, if an indigenous person were to read this, they would probably relate to this, or at least there's a possibility. So research question two on the Pan-Indian collective identity. Um, I wanted to illustrate this a little bit more. Um, this is how the tribe used frame, the tribe or the movement used framing to convey, um, you know, other native people, other indigenous people come stand with us. Like we want you here. Um, even indigenous peoples of the Amazon, you know, we're all related and let's all be in solidarity with one another. And the way that this frame was mutually exclusive from the solidarity frame, again, was this drew on solidarity specifically between um, native peoples and native peoples. And I have a couple examples here. Let's see if they pull up. So here's a letter that the uh, Choctaw Nation wrote to the Standing Rock Sioux. Take a look. Um, Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma wants to offer support. So we saw a lot of these from tribes during this time, as well as other native orgs. I have one more. Connecting for Common Goals. 
This is from the National Congress of American Indians. So we just saw widespread support from other uh, American Indian Native organizations and tribes as well. So this, this frame, while it is somewhat ambiguous um, and certainly open to perception, I, I did see a pattern for this and I did see that there was a significant um, uh, presence of the movement calling on support specifically from other tribes. And that's why, you know, when we see footage of the camps, we see people there from all different tribes. So the nonviolence frame was created specifically to counter frame um, the state that I mentioned earlier. So um, the, a lot of media uh, reports were depicting the movement as violent which we consistently saw that the movement uh, made a conscious effort to frame themselves as nonviolent and peaceful, and oftentimes um, discussed that, you know, our only weapon is prayer. We're only here at the camps praying, and anyone that's being violent towards us, they're being violent, and it's not the water protectors. So uh, we see that there's evidence here of assault and um, that in general, uh, the movement's even fighting for those people who are assaulting them. So it, it brings together really the scope of the significance of this movement. Um, and, and to have to counter frame that they're nonviolent, again, was a direct result of uh, media reports of the protesters or water protectors being violent, which was untrue. Indigenous traditional knowledge and ways. This was the eighth most salient frame. So the ways in which uh, this framing was communicated typically had to do with, um, you know, certain language that if you are involved in a native community, um, you, you may be able to recognize. So that was essentially why I was able to recognize it. Um, I, I saw here, as you can see, um, evidence of talking about Turtle Island, talking about the black snake, which is uh, in relation to the Lakota prophecy. Um, and so the pipeline was often compared to the black snake. So these are um, pieces of evidence of indigenous traditional knowledge that supported um, you know, people's participation in this movement or frame the movement in a way uh, that included principles that were traditionally located um, for specific tribes. So there was evidence of this that were not um, specifically related to the Standing Rock Sioux. Um, but, you know, I mean, right here, the Turtle Island thing, there are a lot of tribal nations that utilize a, a story similar to the Turtle Island uh, story. So some of this was intertribal and some of it was tribally specific. The future generations frame. Um, this came up a lot because we are having to think about who benefits from the movement, right? So is it just the tribe? Is it just the people who live in that area? Um, is it the people downstream whose water would be affected if a pipeline broke? Um, and, and that's what we have to think about, but what the movement consistently showed me um, in analyzing these Facebook posts was that they weren't fighting simply for people and, and beings and, you know, resources that are here now, but they were fighting for the future. Um, and in environmental movements in general, we see a lot of evidence of, you um, future generations kind of being a motivational factor. But when you specifically consider the seventh generation principle as it relates to indigenous communities, um, I found this to be a pretty significant um, when I recognized it because um, what this indicates is that there are beneficiaries that are not here now. So um, when I was trying to think about how to describe this, because it's a little bit ambiguous, is um, I came up with the term symbolic beneficiaries, because when we're thinking about seven generations from now, um, you know, the fate of this planet and the fate of, of natural resources and culture, uh, particular, particularly are, are um, you know, correlated with what are we doing now? So we have to consider symbolic beneficiaries when we think about the future of environmental movements. 
um, and, and talking about future generations was something that came up a lot in the Facebook analysis. And so finally, the 10th most salient frame was one that dealt with colonization or um, evidence of settler colonialism, which we all know is still going on currently. This is not something that just happened in the past. Um, and it recalls that, that contentious relationship between uh, you know, essentially any one indigenous tribe in the United States and the federal government and how this is still so relevant today to not only this fight, but, but most fights when it comes to tribes and the federal government. Um, and so when we see this, this is mostly an identity framing task. So this established the identity of the movement as uh, a group of people that are still fighting this battle that, you know, started with European contact, basically. So this is not only an identity framing task, but it's a reason to take action. It's a reason to um, remember survival and, and how crucial survival is and how um, how much people, indigenous people have thrived despite um, a lot of these barriers that have been put in place by colonization. So that wraps up the top 10 frames. So that answered research question one and two. So when we look at previous research about Standing Rock and about the no DAPL movement, one thing that I found was that there was no, at the time, there was no evidence of um, anyone looking at how the movement itself framed their grievances, framed um, you know, what they wanted from supporters or how to support. There was evidence, um, as you can see here, of uh, <clears throat> how people utilize Twitter to frame controversy, but this was again just Twitter posts. It wasn't stuff that was uh, originating from the movement itself. Um, we see evidence of how uh, networked publics through online distant witnessing and online distant witnessing is essentially watching things on the internet instead of actually being there, which I know um, a lot of us did during the no DAPL movement because not everyone was able to physically show up to any one of the um, established camps and um, be in solidarity in that way. So there's evidence about news coverage. There's evidence about um, how uh, protest strategies were conceptualized and distributed through social media platforms. But again, um, there was no analysis uh, that kind of put in perspective, how did the movement generate uh, what they wanted to happen? So the importance of this research um, generally has to do with the fact that uh, you know, although this is a indigenous and native nation driven fight, solidarity between people of all backgrounds was extremely important because we saw um, not only the largest and most socially connected Indian country at any point in history, um, but we saw millions of people connecting online, um, even if even if it was just simply sharing a hashtag along the way, um, you know, that person participated in getting the word out there and keeping this in the news long enough for actions to take place. Um, we saw that indigenous collective identity through the pan-Indian frame, um, it is a tool in gaining support. And um, I, I think there's more work to do on that. I think that there needs to be, like I mentioned, updated conceptualization around that term um, and then updated considerations for how do we, especially in qualitative research, um, pursue uh, actually analyzing that. And I think there are a lot of opportunities there. Um, like I mentioned previously, indigenous resistance is continuous. So since European contact native nations have had to fight um, just for survival um, and, and you know they're still here now and there are implications with how this movement was able to actually draw on traditional knowledge and those relational values um, to support motivate motivational factors in actually getting involved in this movement and feeling related to this movement and feeling like um, you know you as an individual had uh, had skin in the game in some way. Um, and then finally, the symbolic beneficiaries term that I mentioned earlier, I think is something that um, could be studied further as well, because 
Um, other environmental movements utilize this concept of future generations, but we need to see how it differ differs between um, indigenous communities versus non-indigenous environmental movements. So there are a few, a few limitations on this research. Um, the movement measure. So like I mentioned when I was talking about methods, I had to really whittle this down to define what the movement was going to be in this project. So there are, of course, a lot of other ways that someone could define the movement. They could use a different Facebook page. Um, they could utilize one specific spokesperson, but I found that there really wasn't a specific spokesperson through, throughout the course of this. Um, and because of this, we, we only see data included from one occupation camp. And as we know, there were several others that popped up along the way. And um, we have from this research, no sense of how frames resonated with the audience because I was not analyzing comments. I was not analyzing um, you know, any threads of uh, public uh, participation in the movement, I was only analyzing how the movement got the message out there. So one thing I think that could happen, uh, there's a lot of opportunity for a conversational interview research to actually interview people who participated in the movement from various backgrounds between those who um, participated at camps versus uh, maybe in their urban areas uh, like myself. Um, and of course, how and why did non-Native people participate in the movement? What drew them to the movement besides um, possibly their alignment with principles of, um, you know, uh, of future generation protection and solidarity? And um, finally, significantly right now, uh, the movement for No DAPL and Line 3 are currently happening and have been in the news. So uh, we see updated reasons to have our eyes on these movements. And one thing I'm wondering as well um, is if we'll see any resurgence in a mass uh, organizing of tribes again, like we did previously um, in 2016, as we're coming up into the Biden administration. Let's see. So DAPL today. This brings us to today. This was literally two weeks ago almost. Um, so earlier this year in January, uh, DC Court of Appeals affirmed that the Army Corps of Engineers violated federal law when they issued the permits for DAPL to start running um, in 2016. So that has kind of renewed the legal fight that in, in all honesty never stopped when folks were evicted from the, uh, the, the camps along the Missouri River. Um, but what we saw on April 1st was something we've continually seen throughout time is that this movement is um, in a lot of ways led by indigenous youth. So we see that youth uh, ran to the Capitol to deliver a letter and over 4,000 uh, signatures to the Army Corps of Engineers to urge uh, the Biden administration to shut down the Dakota Access Pipeline and shut down the Line 3 Pipeline in Minnesota um, and to really uphold not only consulting with tribal nations but having real meaningful relationships with tribal nations where essentially uh, folks don't end up in these positions anymore. Uh, I think there's really a long way to go but the message is to really act on that message of build back fossil free, which is a, a, a plug word right now um, for the Biden administration and a, something that folks are hoping happens. And finally, uh, within the past week or so, we saw um, Anishinaabe water protectors and their allies uh, forcibly removed from a prayer lodge that was uh, holding down the path of the Line 3 pipeline that runs through their treaty territories. So this is essentially the same thing happening all over again. And it's something that hasn't stopped happening since, like I said, folks were evicted from these camps. And I think that there is a lot of opportunity for tribal nations to really assess um, how or if they will uh, form some sort of solidarity with the tribes that are affected by pipelines. Um, so that is the conclusion of my presentation and um, I'm open to any questions or comments that we can fit in. So awesome. Thank you so much. Can you hear me, Amelia?
Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you, Ahiehet Wado. Thank you for um, such an incredible presentation and the research that you're doing. Um, unfortunately, we are really tight on time. We really only have a minute left because we have back-to-back -back, uh, sessions and we're not doing it concurrent. Um, but we do have some uh, questions for you. And also for our listeners, what was just shared in the chat is um, a survey. Please fill that out. We shared the, that feedback with the presenters, such as Amelia. And so that could be a chance as well to share your contact information, um, to ask any other questions. And then, uh, Amelia, could people contact you as well if they have questions? Yes, for sure. Uh, they can email me. Um, I don't know if there's a way to give that out um, or find me on Facebook. It's my first and last name. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, you could put it in the chat too and just put to all uh, attendees. But um, some, so as Amelia said, that's how we did meet in Dallas, um, you know, right outside the Energy Transfer Partners uh, building. And, and so these direct connections as well of, um, I, I think that was very powerful from your presentation and especially your question about um, some of these concepts we use like pan-Indianism uh, being, you know, not really appropriate for uh, the, the, these dynamics today and in these recent uh, years and such. And so I think, I, I wonder what concept you are starting to propose about that um, to basically, you know, move that conversation along because I think that relationality and the relatedness uh, kept resurfacing. And, and that certainly, you know, is, is that something that could be, um, turn to more. Does that make sense? And, and that's maybe yeah. something I want to say. And then um, someone did post a question about, are you engaging high school students with your work? And I think that also relates um, to your point about youth, you know, really being involved and at the head on the front lines of all this, um, the whole DAPL movement, right, traces back to youth. So I think that's also an interesting part of, of your research. Are you looking at um, the age in any way of these posts, uh, able to find out anything about the people who post them? Because there are more and more uh, kind of personalities, if you will, or like um, individuals who are open about sharing their identity too, which you often get into. Right. So sorry to throw that at you in like uh, a minute as we have to wrap up, but I thought okay. those come together. Yeah, thank you so much for those um, questions and pieces of feedback. Um, so for your, your first point, um, of course, Pan-Indianism is, I don't like it flat out. I don't like it. Um, a lot of times it's used to kind of perpetuate this very like intertribal like a uh, group of knowledge that really does not apply to any one tribe. And I think most people would reject that idea. Um, I like what you mentioned about relationality. And that's that's a concept I use a lot, just like even in conversation, because um, I think most people can, for lack of better words, relate to it, um, especially in the indigenous community when you kind of know what that involves. But the, the problem that I see here is, again, translating these things to the English language in a way that makes sense to not only native audiences, but non-native audiences. Um, so that's something that I have not necessarily coined like a new term for, um, but I have for sure considered the possibility of using relationality in talking about that relationship. But I think that it has to be kind of redefined in a way that um, in, in some ways um, includes concepts of some of the other frames that I used as well. Um, your second point about youth, um, I personally have not engaged any high school students in this work. However, one thing that I find interesting is how within the recent years, just for social justice initiatives in general, not just indigenous ones, um, the youth are the ones that are really pushing the older generations to be more active and be more present. Um, so high school students, in, even in the DFW area, are a lot of times the ones that are fighting against their racist mascots, for example, or they're the ones that are holding Black Lives Matter uh, protests or 
holding rallies and demonstrations. So I think that youth in general are really catching on to the fact that they do have a lot of leverage in this fight and in it, you know, specifically to this and to other movements, um, they are those future generations that we were talking about and their descendants are even further future generations that will be either benefiting or reaping the consequences of the actions that we take now. Um, so I think that there is actually a little bit of a difference between um, youth involvement um, in areas that are tribal jurisdictions or reservations like Standing Rock, for example, versus maybe an urban area like DFW, where, <clears throat> excuse me, we're not necessarily um, focused on the same issues in, in this, the, the locality that we're in, but overall, everyone does still feel that urge to support um, and then I forget the final one, if we have time. Oh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's all right. I think as well, um, some folks asked about resources to learn about, um, line three, for example. So is there somewhere you would direct people to learn about these movements, a website, something, you know, even just. Yeah, yeah so there's some, um, uh, there's some good education on line three right now out, um, at the honor the earth site um native organizers alliance as well as uh, always the indigenous environmental network so i think that any one of those groups websites you can find information about for sure line three but at least for one or two, or two of them um dapl as well okay wonderful well thank you again i know um other folks commented and uh thanked you and appreciate your uh willingness and all your work to share your work illustrating all these dynamics that are so pressing and important as you shared even today so we'll we'll have to wrap up now unfortunately i know we could continue these conversations and and they certainly need to continue so thank you amelia for joining us